I thought today we could look at garbage collection, which is a form of automatic memory management. So the, the problem here is when you're programming, you never know how much memory your program will use when it's running. So you know, if you're running a, an image processing thing, you don't know how big the photo you'll be editing is. If you're a web browser, you don't know how big the web page will be. So you dynamically have to ask the, the operating system, give me some memory, the physical part of the chip, and you get access to it, and later you give that back, and you go through this sequence. And it turns out to be very difficult to do that manually, and so there are techniques, including garbage collection, that do that automatically. You can't just say, right, give me absolutely loads because I want to be able to use whatever I want then. Well, you can, and it's like in anything in life, you can ask for all the resources and they might even be given uh, to you, but then no one else has access to them. So you're trying to balance out being a, a good citizen uh, with also asking for what you need. Typically, if you go back to older programming languages, and I'll use C as an example, uh, if you wanted memory, you had to ask for it and release it yourself. So um, there are two primitives here. One's called malloc, and malloc says, give me some quantity of memory, please. And the operating system will, and I'll simplify a bit, it will then reserve a physical part of your RAM chip for your program to use. And then free says, I'm done with that block of memory, however big it was, you can have it back, you can free up that physical part of the RAM chip. So if we have a little look at some actual code, we can see how this works and then what the challenges are. So here is a very simple C program. I just filled out the skeleton because I always forget the uh, bits these days. And I can say, uh, I would like to allocate, uh, let's say, 32 kilobytes of memory. So malloc says, uh, give me 32 ki kilobytes of memory. And then I can do things like I can set, so we call that store value. So I can say the first byte, I'll just store the letter H. Oops. Uh, and then I can read values back. So I can say print a character. And there I've got a load. And then when I'm done with that, I can say I would like to free that memory. So that's a, a very valid little program, if I've got it right. Let's just quickly compile it and see how many things I've got wrong. Uh, so it prints out H. That's good. So that's things working correctly. So I've malloced memory and I freed it. So I've been a good citizen. I gave the memory back uh, when I was done with it. So several ways this can go wrong. The first one is I forget to free the memory. So there's now what we call a memory leak. If I don't use that bit of memory uh, for the rest of the program, then the, the operating system will think I've still got claim to it and it won't take it back, even though I may know I will never need it again. And if you have too many of these memory leaks, you run out of memory, you, the resources uh, are no longer there. So that's something we've probably all experienced, your program just exploding, or if your machine going into swap, it's often because of this. So that's one mode of getting things wrong. Another one is I can free memory and then try and read and write from it. So when I've moved the free statement here, I'm then reading and writing, and then that program will explode in various random ways. So the operating system will think, oh, you're done with that memory. I'll give it to someone else or use it in some other way and you're trying to read and write from it. And sometimes it works for a while uh, and then stops working, or you get random data, all sorts of problems can happen. And another one, which I'm particularly fond of, is where you try freeing the same memory twice. Now, the operating system might notice this, but what sometimes happens, you say, I'm done with this memory. Someone else asks for this memory, they get the same pointer, like ID, should we say, and then you free it and you free the memory they're using. So they are, they are perfectly good citizens of Gotham City going about their business with no worries. And you've then said they no longer need the memory and then they go splat. So these are all, I mean, there are some other ones, but these are the classic ways that you can go wrong in traditional memory management. And it turns out as humans, we're incredibly bad at doing this, particularly for big programs. Shouldn't the operating system manage some of this for us? Is, or is that where we're going with this? Sort of. Um, so it turns out it's really difficult for the operating system to do this, but in within our programming languages, we can um, have a, an automatic memory management system that then gives things back, to, uh, the resources back to the operating system more swiftly without us as humans having to say malloc and free. People have realized this is a problem for a long time. And in fact, and perhaps surprisingly, even in the late 1950s, the very first uh, automatic memory management systems were being created. And the basic idea is that you say, I would like to use some memory, and the automatic memory management system will work out when you are finished using it. 
and then it will give it back to the operating system on your behalf. So it, if you were to put this in terms of C, you would have malloc, but you would no longer worry about calling free. And because you no longer have to call free, we can get rid of all of these sources of errors and make things a lot simpler. Okay, so, so there's a book. It feels like there's a book coming. It feels like it. <laughs> there is a butt of sorts. There's, there's a couple of techniques, and one of them is the obvious one and, and has some trade-offs, let's say. So the obvious way of doing this is what's called reference counting. So you say, when I allocate some memory, I'm going to put a little counter saying how many parts of my program are still using this. So when it's allocated, the count will probably be one. And if I give it to someone else to use, the count goes up to two, and when they're done using it, they put the count back to one, and when the count goes to zero, no one's using the memory, it can be freed and go back to the thing. So it's not fully automatic, but it's semi-automatic. And it's definitely less likely to have problems, but there are some consequences. One, I've got to remember to add and decrement these things accurately, which is surprisingly difficult to do uh, correctly. Um, the other one is that means every block of memory now has a little integer associated with it, which takes up extra memory. And surprisingly, the literal adding and uh, incrementing and decrementing these counts can become surprisingly um, punishing in terms of performance if you keep handing them out and getting them back over time. And then just finally, reference counting cannot deal with what are called cycles. So we'll see a, maybe a little example of that later. Um, you can end up finding memory that you have finished using that where the counts are always above zero and cannot be automatically returned. So is that like a memory leak? It is, it is a memory leak, yes, it's a, absolutely a memory leak, exactly the same consequences, your program just grows. But almost worse, it looks to use a program like, I finished using with, uh, this memory, it looks like I've done the right thing, and yet somehow it's not being freed. Um, so that's reference counting has its place, it's still used in, in some languages, but what's more commonly used in most languages now, you know, your JavaScripts, your Javas, um, is what's called garbage collection. Now, sometimes this is used as an umbrella term, but more commonly it's used to mean a specific type of automatic memory management where it's more accurately able to determine when you have finished using some memory. Um, and it works really, really well. So maybe we can see a, a, a little example of that. What I'll do first of all, I'll just run a very stupid little small Python program, and we can just see that there must be some sort of memory management going on. So we'll just make a little class, and we'll make some very long loop. And let's save this. Right, so what this program is going to do is just, in a long loop, keep allocating some memory. Now, naively, if this was C, the, program, the memory usage would just go up and up over time because I'm not saying free. So when I say um, C angle brackets, allocate some memory effectively, and we can just force that to make clear that we're storing some extra things. Somebody must be doing something. And then uh, let's run this, and we'll run this in another window as well. So we'll... See if I picked a big enough number. No, I really need a bigger number to make it run longer. I'm just going to make it run for very long. So the first one of these Python processes, you can see what under, let's take under size, uh, or actually under resources, which doesn't matter which one. The program keeps running and it's never using any more memory. In this case, it actually turns out it's using reference counting at the moment. But as soon as I finish using the memory, it's deallocated. That's automatic memory management of some form working. But what happens if we do something a little bit more sophisticated? So let's kill that. So let's make another new file. And what we're going to do now is just look how one of these garbage collection algorithms work. Now they turn, you can go into huge depth making these things super fast. Uh, but I've just, I will show you the basic algorithm, which is called a mark and sweep algorithm, where we work out which memory is still being used, which can we free. Everything else, all the complexity is just an optimization to make those stages go faster, but they don't affect the fundamentals. So let's save this one. So again, I'll just make an empty class. And what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to make uh, an object. So in Python, this is a blank object. What I'm going to show you is the problem of working at which memory is live at first. So there's a concept of what are called roots. So when we allocate memory, we have to say, which objects am I still using? We call those the roots. And I'll simplify and say any object referenced from a variable is a root. So I'll try drawing and remembering that I have the artistic skill of someone with no artistic skills. In fact, my artistic skills should be legendary for their lack of existence. So we'll say I've got a variable x and it's allocated a chunk of memory over here. It doesn't matter 
what's in that memory particularly. And I have a reference to it. So now we can say um, one of the roots is x. So it's pointing to that memory. And you know, intuitively, that block of memory here is alive because I'm still pointing at it. And I can make a second variable called y. And that will also have another block of memory over here. I'm getting some very variable with arrows here. doesn't really matter. Intuitively, now both of those blocks of memory are still being pointed at. They have roots, so they're alive. Now, the first thing I can say is I'm going to put the null value or none value in Python into the variable y. So now I've effectively removed that pointer there now. So intuitively, this second object, the, the one with the thinner lines, is no longer being pointed to. So what's going to happen in Mark and Sweep algorithm is the garbage collector every so often is going to say, what memory is still accessible? So it's going to start at the roots and it will say, OK, variable x, see what you point to. Ah, you point to something over here, so I'll mark that as tickets being used. Variable y, that's pointing to nothing, nothing to do there. And then it says, right, I've finished the mark phase of the algorithm. Look at all the objects in the memory. There are two. One of them I ticked. I could reach. The other one, no tick. So I can now deallocate that. So mark, work out what's live, sweep, get rid of the stuff that isn't. So that's the very simple version. And then you have to think, what happens if there are more complex graphs than just two variables? And this algorithm is so simple, it scales really nicely. So uh, I will put back the object into y. And I will say that the x object now has a reference to the y object. So I have this little line going over here. OK, so now I've got, if I was to do run the mark sweep stage, both of those objects are clearly accessible. But now imagine if again I say y is none, I get rid of this, and I run the garbage collector. First object I can reach from x, yes, tick that, and then it will then do what's called a reachability algorithm. What can be reached from this object? Well, if I go from this object I've just marked with a tick and via the y reference, Oh yeah, look, I can take that one as well, it's in use. So now I don't want to free that second one, even though it's not being directly pointed to from a variable. So in this case, it won't have to get rid of any of those objects in memory. And that, in a nutshell, is garbage collection. There are some other details, perhaps we want to talk about a few, but really that's the core of the algorithm. It's very nice and simple, very intuitive. And the nice thing is it will free all of the stuff I can't reach. So it sweeps away anything that's not marked. Exactly. So a sweep is just a Boolean flag, just is this reachable, yes or no? And if at the end of the mark phase it's not marked as reachable, out it goes. And this might be completely irrelevant compared to this, but just thinking about the kind of idea of allocating or grabbing some memory, why don't programs just get memory when they need it? Why do they have to kind of grab some, allocate it? And ah, okay, good question. We have this idea that in, in or sometimes we have this idea that programs such in a sense like know in advance what they're going to need to do. But you know, imagine you're writing the software for like a, a, a web, uh, like an e-commerce basket. How many items are people going to put in the basket? Some people are going to buy one, the shopaholics are going to buy a hundred. So you never know in advance how much you'll need to do. And so this is really all about allowing you to dynamically allocate memory because you just don't know how much you'll need dynamically free it. So over time your process will its memory usage will go up and down depending on what you need. And your process might run for days, weeks, months, going down to tiny amounts, going up to huge amounts. Also bearing in mind that even with a very simple program like the one I'm writing, you can easily allocate hundreds of megabytes, if not gigabytes per second. So if you don't free memory pretty quickly, you run out of resources really quickly. Are there any problems with this then? There is one, and it goes back a little bit to our reference counting example earlier which is um, sometimes people find they're using, say, Java, which has amazing quality garbage collection algorithms, and yet their program seems to leak memory and, and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's because they've got a root left. In other words, they have a pointer to what looks like one little object and, and, and which they've forgotten that they're keeping alive. That object points to, it, it, directly or indirectly to millions of other objects, you know, gigabytes of memory. And as long as there's that one little pointer left, the rest of the stuff won't be freed. So occasionally you have this challenge of my memory is huge and you have to find often there's this one little reference you need to clear in order that the garbage collector can realize all of the other stuff isn't reachable. And there are tools to help you with that, but it's something that all of us uh, get wrong at some point. And my last question, doesn't marking the memory use memory? 
Yes, it does. And so I, I alluded to earlier that the, the real algorithm, so say if you look in the Java virtual machine that has several different garbage collectors, they go do some amazing tricks uh, to squash down the memory. So the marking thing is one single bit in memory. It's stored alongside some other information that you have to have around. And so more or less, not only does it not take up any room, but implicitly, you remember when I was doing the little example, after each phase, I went and cleared the little tick marks, the marks. And the proper garbage collectors say, hey, even going over all the objects and, and, and setting them to false, the mark bit, that is just too slow. So what we'll do, we'll remember last time, was it, did the mark bit set to true mean free or does the mark bit set to false mean free? So they don't have to go around and unset things. It's so all sorts of little optimizations to make this as fast as they possibly can. And when you have got a memory leak, is that why we turn things off and on again? <laughs> yes, and uh, I am a, uh, a habitual turner offer and back honor again, because yes, it really does fix memory leaks and many other patented and unpatented problems. And if I make that number a lot bigger, so I make it an order of magnitude bigger, this for loop, it now takes a bit longer. And if I make it longer again, We'll see, depending on which style of core it's gone on. I think, I think it's within three cycles. And then, if you go any longer, then it's going to take you longer. You know, your, your